Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 2017 Intelligence and National Security Summit. Please welcome Chuck Alsup, President of the Intelligence and National Security Alliance. Good morning, everybody. Uh, there's an insert in your program. We've had some, uh, some speaker things move around. We've had some times move around. So there's an insert in there that will give you the latest up-to-date things. I think we're going to have a few more things that change here before the, the next two days are over. Um, but uh, part of the changes today were driven by uh, Tom Bossert's schedule. Uh, uh, we uh, were anxious to have him uh, come talk to us. Uh, but uh, he also has... I think an appointment with the vice president later, so we uh, uh, have to get him out of here at a certain time, and, uh, and we're going to endeavor to do that. But, uh, but Tom, thanks uh, for being here with us. Uh, obviously, I'll know he's the assistant to the president for Homeland Security and counterterrorism on the National Security Council. We're honored that he's here uh, and, he, and that he juggled his schedule to be here. That says a lot, and Tom, we are very grateful. Thanks. Um, now, uh, there will be a sign that goes up on the IMAGs here uh, that will tell you how to submit questions. Okay, there's going to be an email address, so use your smartphone uh, to send the emails. Uh, they will be going to uh, Roger uh, with, uh, on, a, on an iPad up here. Uh, so we're going to see if we can do this high-tech thing, so help us out and send your questions in, okay? Um, one last thing I want to mention is you all got a program. We're doing a very abbreviated welcome here right now. We're going to do a little bit more uh, uh, complete welcome, a little bit. But the, uh, uh, if you look at your agenda thing on the back of it, if you haven't done it already, it will tell you how to lo download the app uh, to your phone. I think it's Intel Summit 2017 uh, in the App Store. OK, so download your app, and it'll tell you all the other stuff about how to, how to move around for the next two days. OK? so. Without further delay, let me introduce Roger Mason, Senior Vice President of National Security and Intel at Noblis, who's going to moderate our first session. Roger, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chuck, and uh, good morning to all of you. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and I just can't think of a better way to set the tone and tenor for the next two days than having our opening speaker, uh, Mr. Tom Bossert. Um, he's known to all of you, but let me just recap a little bit of his very distinguished career. Currently the President's Homeland Security Advisor, uh, but prior to that he has a very distinguished career in government to include uh, time at, the, at, the, uh, uh, at FEMA, time at the uh, Office of uh, Special Counsel, time at the, uh, as Director of Infrastructure Protection, and also uh, time as the Deputy Director for the Homeland Security Advisor under then uh, President George W. Bush. Uh, he holds a BA in economics from the University of Pittsburgh and a law degree from the George Washington U University. So please join me in welcoming and thanking uh, Mr. Tom Bossert for joining us this, this morning. Thank you. So Tom, what we'd like to do is actually have you start off uh, telling us a little bit about what's on your mind um, uh, and your plate this morning. So. Uh, Roger, thank you. Uh, Chuck, thank you. Trish Long and Bob Shea. Uh, Jake Jacoby, really thank you for inviting me and thank you to this august group um, for me to be the one to control your schedules as the first in my career, so uh, thank you for that. It also feels a little like an interrogation, so well staged uh, for the intelligence community. Uh, I can't see you, uh, but the bright lights here allow me to only uh, tell the truth, so I think that's the idea. A um, couple of things, I guess to answer your question, uh, outside the intelligence world, what's on my mind this morning is on the television of most Americans today, and that is uh, Hurricane Irma. So before we get into the uh, intelligence and fun stuff, uh, let's get into the really scary stuff, and that is the, uh, the crisis upon us. I thought we just, and I'm going to say this uh, with some background and knowledge to say it, uh, pulled off the best, well-integrated, fully integrated uh, operational response at a federal, state, and local level in our nation's history. Uh, in responding to Hurricane Harvey in Texas. And I think that that's uh, based in fact, not just uh, anecdote. And then uh, we got 24 hours rest and we are waiting for Irma. So that was something that 
uh, struck me on the way over here was forecast. And so perhaps a lesson here in intelligence-led planning. Uh, we had not just a forecast of this storm, but the NOAA folks this year forecast as a modeling matter that this would be a above normal and dangerous hurricane season. So uh, there you go. We should listen to our forward modeling and forecasts. <clears throat> uh, Irma is probably hitting the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico right now as we sit here. That's on my mind. Uh, and it is forecast to hit Florida and cause uh, a lot of damage. So that's on my mind this morning, uh, but it is not the only thing on my mind as you're very important to me. Uh, the counterterrorism mission is very important to me. Uh, the uh, cybersecurity mission is forefront on my mind most days. And that strikes me that all of these are functional responsibilities and they're all downside risk. So uh, that's, that's what I do for a living and that's what I'm here to talk about. So I appreciate the invite and uh, we'll give you an Irma update before I leave. Great, thank you very much. Uh, well, we know we're, your time is very valuable and the enormity of your schedule. So let's just jump right in with some content. Um, you sit at a unique vantage point at the intersection of homeland security, cybersecurity, uh, and, uh, uh, um, and intelligence. And so the, the question is, uh, one of the instruments uh, providing the intelligence that's needed to do that job uh, is the FISA Amendment Act, uh, first done in 2008 after 40 years of the FISA, uh, FISA Act, uh, reauthorized in 2012. Uh, and, but it sunsets uh, this December. Um, what's the impact? Um, how important is the FISA Act, and particularly the 702 provision, with respect to your job and the larger Homeland Security apparatus? I'll give you the talking point first, and that is that the terrorist threat's not going to sunset, and so the authorities shouldn't either. Uh, but that's a little glib, so let me give you a better answer. Uh, if I can, though, let me take a step back. So I try to look at this from the strategic perspective of what it is we're doing and how we're gonna to continue to do it as a society. And what we did nine years ago, nine and a half years ago, was modernize a uh, otherwise fine law that required us to do things that we couldn't do anymore for practical reasons. And that is to adapt to an app driven, Chuck mentioned there's an even, even an app uh, for this conference, uh, internet connected world. And the idea at the time was that we can't continue to pursue, as you in this room know, individual court orders against foreign adversaries with foreign intelligence value in foreign lands who might happen to choose, understandably so, because it's superior in class and performance, uh, the U.S. internet service provider backbone or a U.S. developed app uh, or a Google uh, storage platform. And so the idea of a foreign terrorist in a foreign land uh, using Gmail uh, was a novel concept in 1976. It's obviously a uh, prevalent practice today. And so what we have to do is think about this in the context of lawful access to information. And I know that is sometimes viewed as a code word uh, to some about encryption and other things. That's not the intent. Uh, call it lawful collection of information. But whatever you call it, the idea of cybersecurity and 702 authority uh, and even, I don't know if he's here, but uh, Patty McGinnis, my fine friend from the United, is here. Thank you, Patty, for being here. Uh, he is uh, a leader here that deserves a lot of credit uh, for encouraging me and the administration to do the right thing on US-UK data sharing, and I'll talk about that here uh, in a moment. Uh, it is currently President Trump's um, position that we should pass legislation on the Hill uh, and I believe Patty McGinnis stands as the first ever uh, foreign official to have testified to both our House and Senate on legislation that the U.S. Uh, wants, or maybe on any legislation. So thanks for being here, Patty. Um, but all three of these things are connected. And the idea being that we now have to, unless that law is passed, go through a long and slow process wherein a foreign court has to request of our U.S. companies compliance with a foreign or court order. That takes a long time for those of you that are familiar with the process. And in the interim, we end up with criminals, terrorists, and other malefactors uh, languishing or getting away in some instances. And that, that's not acceptable. There's a much easier and faster way. Uh, we're pursuing that, but it all has to do with modernizing our means and uh, methods of transferring data and allowing access uh, not only to our government, to our data and our company's data, but foreign governments that are trusted uh, with certain rules. And so back to 702. To me, 702 is probably one of those things that should have sunset so that Congress could review it. Uh, I concede that. But now that we've gone through nine years of bipartisan use and demonstrated value, 
this Congress should be exceedingly pleased with how it has been implemented and how it has protected the U.S. people against those abuses that they foresaw. Uh, so fortunately, they uh, should be proud of it and they should reauthorize it. Unfortunately, that's going to require us to re-educate some members that weren't here at the time, to educate the public on what we do as an intelligence community, and to ensure them that we have some trustworthy mechanism in place uh, that will allow them to have trust in their government institutions. And uh, I'm here to do that, so I'll speak to the details of it. Uh, but I want to make sure you think about this from a strategic perspective. Uh, why is it that we need to have a separate standing uh, section of law that allows us to, I think we're the only country uh, in the world, that has such a thing that allows us to provide this protection, in some cases even to foreigners uh, that have intelligence value for us. So <clears throat> right now that information uh, is arbitrarily cabined off by jurisdictional boundary. Uh, and what I'll do today is for those of you in the intelligence community, I'll offer you a challenge as we move forward. And that challenge is for us to determine ways to better mission integrate by function, uh, as opposed to mission integrating by geography. Uh, you know, I've inherited a world in which we still have regional uh, directors on the NSC staff. I think that's a valuable thing. We have a Russia desk and a China desk and so on. Uh, that's a world that we lived in since World War II. Uh, when the Homeland Security Council was invented, uh, I had the privilege of, of serving in it and on it, on the staff. The, uh, the idea was to develop functional directorates, cybersecurity, which is a transnational issue, counterterrorism, transnational issue. Uh, even Homeland Security exceeds our borders and parameters. It's not a Western Hemisphere desk. It's a Homeland Security function. And so the idea here of data uh, existing in uh, a server in Seattle and being relevant to a terrorism prosecution of a British citizen in London, uh, having to wait for a year while process is ironed out, uh, is not an acceptable outcome. And so uh, Patty and I are working together have now proposed on both sides of the pond that we engage in a new world order in which that happens much more quickly. And once the Attorney General certifies uh, that that other country has the right principles of law to protect uh, that thing that we consider our American values, uh, then we can establish a more trusted relationship in the executive branch. Uh, that will happen. And once we provide that information in a more efficient manner, then companies like Microsoft and others won't have to decide where to house their repository of data and develop artificial business models. Uh, instead, they'll be able to sell a 365 account with uh, surety to uh, a British citizen and keep that data wherever it's most uh, relevant. So uh, that takes me back to 702. 702 is an authority that allows the U and authority that allows the U.S. government to collect foreign information from foreign errors, non-U.S. citizens, on foreign land. It doesn't allow collection against U.S. citizens. We can't target them. It doesn't allow collection of a for on a foreigner that's here in the United States. And so there's a whole lot of misnomer around this authority. Uh, we'll clarify it with some Q&A. But as you think about it, in 10, 15 years with technologies like blockchain and other things that are emerging, uh, think about how increasingly odd it will sound to our grandchildren that we had to have a conversation about where the data was stored and what signpost it touched as it went through an efficiently organized internet and then come back to this conversation and watch it. They'll probably watch it on a device we can't conceive of. So uh, let me stop there and we'll go back to 7 to 2 later. Great. <clears throat> That's a terrific full, fulsome answer that I'm sure the, uh, the audience uh, appreciated for sure. Uh, so you mentioned the topic cybersecurity several times, and obviously none of us can go through our daily lives without hearing about a breach or uh, uh, of some magnitude. And, and if you look back to some of the big ones, uh, Sony, Sands Casino, uh, OPM, and others, um, you know what's striking is, you know, with really garden variety tactics, uh, nation states or other organizations can achieve strategic effects um, through through the cyber from that perspective. When you think about what we need to do as a consolidated national security enterprise uh, of combining cyber threat intelligence with the network defenders and adding strategic context in terms of the why, um, what's your sense in terms of how we're doing with respect to, first of all, that integration, and second of all, are there some things that we need to do or could do uh, more to kind of help that? For example, um, there have been some who've advocated uh, uh, creating an NCTC, National Counterterrorism Center, like entity for cyber across the government. That's got pros and cons, uh, obviously. So I think the audience would be uh, uh, interested in hearing your reaction to, to that topic. So I know. yeah, 
a broad topic, a narrow question. Let me yeah. see if I can um, answer it in reverse. Okay. Uh, so here's the answer, and maybe a timely uh, answer, on the organizational construct. Uh, I'm now President Trump's Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor. I have an obligation and responsibility to make the current construct work and work well. Uh, First, you don't have to be bad to get better. For anyone that takes my observations about improvement as an indictment of their current performance, do not do so. Uh, we have an opportunity now to take the construct of the Department of Homeland Security cyber mission and improve upon it. Uh, I think it deserves a lot of credit for that which it has done. I think it deserves a lot of support as it tries to improve, and I think that it needs to improve in capacity in, in arms and legs. But I also think that there's some authorities issues that we're going to have to discuss, and I don't want to get too far in front of our cyber strategy as we roll that out. But the idea here, uh, again, takes me back to our friends in Great Britain. Uh, there are two constructs here. We've got an Israeli model and a British model, uh, both of which have demonstrated some success. But it is misunderstood in the, in the following way. There's an organizational construct and there's an authority construct. I'd rather focus on what it is we'd like this entity to do and not where we want to house it. And the idea now is that we've got DHS, it is functional, it is working, and it, it requires the love and attention and care of appropriators and authorizers to make it better if it requires uh, improvement. I believe it does, uh, but not because it's performing badly, but because it could do better in terms of a defined mission. Uh, that's the answer on organizational construct. I want to make sure I'm clear on that. Uh, we don't need to create an NCTC model. Uh, if in a year and a half's time we've still failed to produce results, I anticipate that that will be uh, the public debate and we'll end up having to do something of that nature just to bring the attention it requires uh, to the subject. However, I'm here to bring that attention without an organizational construct. Uh, we have DHS, we're going to make it work. Now let's talk about the authorities. That's the bigger question. Uh, this is the tough one. How do we, in our own national interest, continue to be dominant in and able to collect on what we all refer to as SIGINT, uh, but collecting information on the internet against our adversaries in a way that informs our policymakers and decision makers, while also behaving within a set of norms that allow the regular citizenry to conduct commerce, to, to communicate to one another? I think the answer to that is uh, a little bit more uh, obvious to Americans than the rest of the world because we impose our own values on it. But what I'd like to see in the future uh, is a world in which we have that kind of common agreement among our uh, like-minded allies and that we not only have norms, but we enforce them. Now, this is going to look a little bit like a, uh, a law enforcement criminal matter. In other words, cybersecurity is a little bit misunderstood. It's more about cyber risk management. We will never have a world in which it's an inherently and completely safe internet, in my view, uh, at least in my current understanding of the technology. But what we will have is an opportunity to clearly take those who offend the law and punish them. And so that's going to require three or four things, and that's going to uh, start with an attribution standard. Uh, it's going to start with agreement upon uh, certain bedrock norms of behavior, what we will and won't do. And it's going to start with a requirement that we have allies in that. And for right now, uh, I love multilateral bodies for a lot of reasons, and for establishing norms, they're very beneficial. Uh, but I don't always love multilateral bodies for the purpose of enforcement. They have different uh, political agendas and they have different uh, group dynamics that don't allow for the, the individual defense of the United States, let's say, in this instance. And so what I hope to do is roll out in a way that increases our defenses because I do not believe that any other adversary will just stop and behave because we tell them to. Uh, and those defenses have to um, not only uh, be a shared responsibility with local uh, authorities and individuals, but they have to require us to improve our capability and capacity at DHS, and so that's something that we'll promote. I would stop right now because Congress is back in session. Instead of cajoling them like I'll do on 702, I'd like to thank them for giving us more money on this mission. Uh, we're going to get more money from them this year. We're going to get more money next year. It's necessary. Uh, and the collective defense is going to require a political conversation in this country about how much we want to trust our government entities uh, to defend our networks and at what level. Uh, and that will be maybe a little bit of a veiled conversation, but it, it strikes me that I'm talking to you, the intelligence community here in the room, but there's also cameras in the back uh, that might capture this for the, for the rest of the American public. So I want to make sure I keep it at the right level. Uh, I think that uh, the last allusion I'll make here on cyber uh, is to the need to take those countries that have an asymmetric uh, uh, you know, advantage over our companies 
and to remind them again that if they haven't already agreed with us to stop that behavior, that we won't tolerate them using their government capabilities and their intelligence collection capabilities, which are strong and well-funded, to collect against our individual uh, profit-making companies like Coca-Cola or, or the DNC, for that matter, any user of the dot-com. Uh, that's something we can't tolerate, and that's something that they've pledged to not do, uh, especially as it relates to stealing commercial information for their own company's benefits. So uh, I'm pleased that the last administration, in a bipartisan way here, attained that relationship with China and those agreements, uh, but they were non-binding, so we want to remind the Chinese to make sure that they uh, remain within the spirit of that agreement. And if we see any evidence that they're not, we will call them on it. And um, in the interim, uh, that's what we'll continue to do. Uh, at the end of the day, we'll improve the authorities to allow us to defend a little bit more greatly. Terrific. Um, you know, let me follow up on an earlier statement, uh, assertion that, that you made, which is a, an interesting one and an important one. Uh, when you look at um, <clears throat> the post-9-11 world, where we've spent a lot of time as a national security community integrating the peace parts, and in particular, again, you've got that unique vantage point, um, where we've got to integrate the intelligence community with federal law enforcement and homeland security. Uh, you mentioned early on that, um, that the emphasis ought to be on cross-functional missions as yep. opposed to, to regions. So, uh, first of all, what, what is your sense in terms of the state of integration post 9-11 since you've been uh, involved in this uh, since, its, since its, its, its birth uh, after 9-11? And um, uh, is an example, what, what's a prime example of a cross-functional mission that we really can spend some time and effort on to, to move the needle, so to speak? Yeah, there's, uh, the, the, the state of our uh, community is better and stronger. I think that's a given. And that goes across the board. So from a prevention perspective, all the way through to the response perspective that I mentioned at the outset here. Um, the two things, I guess, that struck me the most in transitioning back, it's kind of a constant state of comparative, comparative analysis I'm engaged in. Uh, I've joked that I'm literally back in the same office suite, and it took me 10 years to get promoted 10 feet. Um, uh, from, the, from the vantage point I hold now, and the vantage point I held then as the Deputy Homeland Security Advisor, uh, three things have happened. First, the world has become increasingly more complex in terms of its interconnectivity, the questions that are more difficult, that uh, transcend boundaries and become transnational. Um, second, the threat has become more acute and widespread at the same time. Those are two different things. Uh, we were using the AUMF when I left. It's almost nostalgic uh, in two countries. Uh, and, and now we're using the AUMF in more. Uh, and now we've got m upwards of 17 or 18 uh, nation states that might uh, be failed or, or viewed as close to failing. And they have a strong presence of either ISIS or Al-Qaeda or other groups or all three or more. Uh, that is a troubling development. And so uh, for the last eight years, we've done a nice job at keeping the leadership at bay uh, some people have uh, gruesomely referred to that as kind of weeding or mowing the lawn. Uh, I don't like that term, uh, but if you, take, if you take that analogy, while we've taken the large leadership uh, weeds out of that analogy, we've seen the lawn spread. And so from a counterterrorism perspective, uh, I'm alarmed at the, at the spreading of the ideology and of the group's presence into other ungoverned spaces. Uh, and that is just the counterterrorism threat. Uh, the growth of the cyber threat uh, we just covered. Uh, it's trending in the wrong direction. It's why we have an urgent need for an increased defense as a country. Uh, there is no, there's nothing defensive about that. Uh, I'll explain that more in a little bit. Uh, but we need a greater ability to defend against an inherently vulnerable technology uh, problem right now. Uh, and then thirdly, what strikes me is that the institutions have matured as we envisioned, and that's encouraging, but some of the holders of the positions have not. And so we all go through institutional turnover. Uh, some of the leadership of this organization here in the front row uh, have long distinguished careers and now have uh, unfortunately left us. And so while there is a new crop of leaders, uh, the feeder pool of staff have in some cases, and I'll pick on the, the young man that came here with me today, don't really recall 9-11. And uh, that struck me as, as profound as I walked into my office. There is a, a generation of Americans now that view 9-11 the way uh, I might have viewed Pearl Harbor. It was historic, it was understandably profound, but it seemed distant. And it seemed like something that may not happen again uh, until you grow up and realize that 
uh, it does and will and can. And um, so I guess I would take a little bit of a plug to not only mission integrate by function, which is something that's a little bit uh, of a mouthful to those of you that work in a multi-agency, multi-jurisdictional world. Uh, and that needs some improvement. It's, it's the second time I've mentioned it. I'll say the third time before I leave this stage. Uh, I am, and I'll give you an example uh, in a second. I am uh, a little bit uh, dismayed at our uh, inability to mature more quickly through those jurisdictional and uh, agency boundaries. Uh, but, uh, you know, this, this maybe is a, uh, a counter-narcotics example mm -hmm. to take me out of terrorism sure. or, or a human trafficking example. Uh, we in the intelligence world tend to focus on intelligence for, you know, the PDB every morning. Uh, we also tend to focus on intelligence that will inform an operator. It's the intelligence that informs an operator that could be better integrated into mission and function. And at DHS, I know uh, David Glowey is there now, and he's going to do a great job in advancing this. It's not just a terrorist threat. He's going in, to increase that intelligence-led policing and sharing mission and role in a way that then informs the Customs and Border Patrol, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, the Mexican uh, and South American partners that we have are going to share their information with us and us conversely with them to address the pernicious problem uh, of transnational crime and drug-related crime. Those types of things require intelligence to inform policing activity. And uh, that's what I mean by mission and function integration. Um, uh, that's the example maybe to give you. But that's a good uh, one. Uh, so let me leave with the people here. I set up that the people are a short, uh, shortcoming. Uh, Goldwater Nichols had a great solution to this. And I think perhaps the authors of it thought they were going to make a better class of flag officer. And they require, for those of you that don't know here, that you have some degree of joint operational experience, training, and education as a prerequisite to promotion. We're going to have this great class of flag officer. Instead, what we got was something better. We got a much better feeder pool of candidates that increased and, 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 and bettered the readiness posture of our entire military. And what I'd like to start doing is thinking about how to do that across not just our intelligence community as narrowly defined, but across a wider scope, defining it to include law enforcement, international and domestic partners. If we have a by, with, and through strategy uh, on counterterrorism, then we have to think through the challenges of a federated information gathering and sharing model. Uh, if that is the case, then we're going to have to rethink some of our rules <coughs> governing intelligence sharing, as most of you in the room know. Uh, if we have an intelligence-based broader scope professional development program, we won't just have a better class of SES candidates, we'll have a better feeder pool, and, um, and I'll give you my two cents on, on the distinction between these things. Uh, if you can get somebody to spend a year or two in the shoes of a, of a consumer of the intelligence that they collect and analyze, uh, they'll be a better collector and a better analyst. Uh, if you can then train them, and the difference between training and education is that you educate to innovate, uh, you train to replicate. So when you train them, you train them to replicate a process or a procedure or a function. Uh, when you educate them, you open their horizon, open their mind. And so what I'd like to do, for those of you that are leaders in our government space right now, is encourage you to start allowing your best and brightest to leave you. I know that's counterintuitive, uh, but do it in a way that's looking at the future of their career and start cultivating them. Uh, I joke about the same young man I criticized not remembering 9-11. I also tell him he's going to be the next CIA director. It's just going to take him 30 years to get there. Uh, so let's see if we can think about our professional development as we think about our mission integration. And, uh, that would be the three things that I've seen. More threat, more complexity, and a waning uh, uh, memory, I guess, in our workforce. That's terrific. I know on that last topic in terms of human capital, I speak for a lot of people in this room, um, the joint duty program in the IC, while not mature like the Goldwater Nichols, was certainly something that we that paid huge dividends yep. for exactly the reasons you were talking about. The experience that was gained, whether it was in a, another agency or at the ODNI, it was just tremendous and, and really well, well conceived. Okay, so we have some time. We're going to switch gear here. I have <clears throat> I've switched with my handwritten notes that we're all trained to do in the IC, and now I've gone to an iPad. Uh, and so now it's time for questions from, from, from the audience. And, um, and they're coming in like a stock ticker, so I apologize in advance that we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but let's get to a few. Here's one. Uh, what's the status of the cyber deterrence options developed as part of the President's executive order on cybersecurity? Hmm. If there's a congressman in the room, uh, I know some of you are interested in seeing the reports uh, that were called for in that executive order, and we will make sure that within the bounds of appropriateness that we do share them uh, with you and your teams. 
Um, here's here's the, the status uh, administratively, and then I'll give you the status conceptually. The status administratively, uh, you can go back and look at the President's executive order as being broken into three categories, uh, a category of increasing uh, our, our defenses to our federal network, uh, our networks. And then secondly, to increase the defensive ability to protect our critical infrastructure, in particular our Section 9 entities, those that are the most critical of the critical infrastructure uh, sector operators. And then thirdly, uh, this, this section that I'll call two sides of a coin, uh, it's been referred to as deterrence, but remember, uh, we first have to decide what it is that we think is and is not acceptable and what we can live by in terms of a golden rule. And then we can think through what it is that we'll do to those that violate those rules. And so um, uh, the status administratively uh, is there are a series of reports called for and recommendations called for in that executive order somewhere at 90 days that passed uh, now a month or so ago, a month and a half ago, uh, somewhere at 180 days and, and farther out, and so they're not yet upon us. And so those reports that were called upon uh, have been provided. Only one of them to date, I am proud to tell you, uh, was late. Uh, it was not late by much. I won't name the uh, agency, uh, but I think they were big enough to have a good excuse, and uh, you can surmise. So uh, now, we, what we'll do with that, uh, we'll think through the data that we collected. Some of this is extensive, and I think it'll, what I didn't want to do was have a confirmation bias problem. Coming into the office, I probably could have sat down and written what Tom Bossert wanted our nation's cybersecurity strategy to look like and then jammed it past our Congress in a hurry, and, and, or at least by our cabinet. I don't think that would have been a wise way to make policy. I'm sure I'd have made a mistake. Uh, instead, what the President chose to do was make sure that we validate all our assumptions, get information and input from you, men and women, uh, and also from uh, his incoming cabinet. Uh, we're getting that information, and I think what we'll do uh, on the deterrent side is, is end up figuring out a, me a means and a method to apply elements of national power outside of cyber uh, to, to punish bad behavior. Uh, and we'll try to do it in a way that's uh, commensurate uh, with, the, uh, with the offense and also revocable or revocable in a way that's not uh, going to create a long-term escalatory posture. And so um, uh, if we have a bad actor that does something increasingly uh, unacceptable, I think what we'll have to do is punish them in a way that's real world and not cyber world. In fact, there's very little reason to believe that an offensive cyber attack is going to have any deterrent effect uh, on a cyber adversary. In fact, it's going to encourage them to hurry up and become better hackers and develop better defenses. And so I think that's not only a misnomer, uh, but it's something we have to move past and say out loud. Uh, at this point, we're going to have to punish them in a way that changes or modifies their behavior, while also defending against what will continue to happen regardless of what we do to punish people. Um, you see how difficult a problem it is to apply pressure to the Venezuelan uh, dictator or to the North Korean uh, regime. So uh, what we'll do is both. Yeah. <clears throat> Terrific. Uh, tough topic for sure. The, um, here's a good question that touches on some of the issues we, we mentioned earlier, and it cuts across many different lines. And um, they're, gonna re they're referring to the Cyber Mission Force as part of Cyber Command. And the question is, can you describe the process or the concept um, of how to utilize the Cyber Mission Force to react to a cyber attack on privately owned critical infrastructure? Can you expand and give examples about possible triggers to that action? Yeah, so the first won't be a trigger. Uh, the first potential outcome of our public debate that we're about to em embark upon uh, would be to allow some of the most critical of critical operators to be within kind of the, uh, within the envelope, as you say, in, in the British or Israeli model. Uh, let's, let's pick on the Israelis for a little bit because they've provided a lot of, uh, of good positive lessons for us to learn from. Uh, they'll have the size and uh, benefit of a smaller country, but they also have a different uh, you know, kind of trust in their security functions as a government. Uh, they've provided essentially what I'll call a virtual iron dome uh, over their country, and they'll defend everything within it from a government perspective. It doesn't require a trigger in their model. Uh, in their model, uh, any bad um, incoming signature is something that's subject to their immediate blocking, mirroring, or, or, or rejection notification or otherwise to the uh, intended target. And so it's not so much a trigger as it is uh, their model, 
uh, has allowed them to use their capabilities and their, their government authorities to protect everyone within their country. Uh, we could pursue something that narrowly allows us to do that only to the most critical uh, of users of our internet and our dot com within a carefully constructed set of bounds uh, so as to not allow for any abuse into privacy concerns. Uh, or we could do that plus a trigger-based system. The trigger-based system, though, is what we have right now, I would argue. If we're going to keep it, we're going to have to increase our capacity tenfold. Uh, we don't have what it takes right now to see an incoming bad, uh, malicious kind of piece of code and then get an FBI agent out fast enough to every potential target. Uh, some of these phishing attacks might end up affecting 20,000 computers. Uh, to then take an FBI agent, send them out, have them knock on the door and say, excuse me, your computer might be the victim of a phishing attack and uh, I can't tell you how I know, but please take the following remedial steps. Would require a significant increased investment in our uh, FBI, which is important, but not quite to that level. I don't think it's achievable, uh, but also in our intelligence community. So uh, to the trigger question, let's see if we can reframe the question and think through how much trust we can allow our government uh, to have of its people and how much of a authority we can um, you know, then maybe wrap around those things that we consider critical. Okay, terrific. Uh, I think we have time for about one, one more question. Uh, so let's... Let's, um, let's do two more. Two more. Okay, yeah, very on. good. So uh, here's one uh, res with respect to Homeland Security uh, and the IC. Uh, DHS has two IC components, the Headquarters Intelligence and Analysis Staff and the U.S. Coast Guard. But other DHS components, such as CBP and TSA, also gather intelligence. And DS DHS shares the intelligence with state and local officials. What must be done to improve the collection, analysis, integration, sharing in the Homeland Security Intelligence Enterprise? Yeah. This is my opportunity to say a third time, thank you for that question, uh, that we need a mission integrate by function. Uh, I think if you were to go throughout DHS right now and ask each uh, individual subcomponent what they're doing to collect information, who sets their information collection requirements, uh, who establishes their analytic uh, standards, and with whom do they share that information, analyze or raw, you'll get a different answer, a different priority, and a different set of um, uh, standards in each instance. And that doesn't mean, again, that they're doing a job poorly. It just means that we have an opportunity here to improve. And my challenge would be to figure out a way, and David Glau is going to have his hands full on this, uh, to better integrate and to better prioritize across those subcomponents of DHS. It's a large department, uh, 300,000 plus people, and they have a lot of responsibilities from immigration enforcement to uh, intercoastal fisheries enforcement. And uh, intelligence can lead into each one of those efforts, uh, but it can't be uh, diffuse to the point where there's no prioritization. And right now what you'll see is uh, uh, an opportunity, I guess I would call it, to improve that integration. And it's going to require some people to let down their guard and allow for some centralized management. And I think that there's an opportunity here under Elaine Duke right now to do that. And uh, she's got my top cover and support every day. Terrific. Um, that's, a, that's a great segue into the last question then. It comes from uh, one of the universities that are represented here. And uh, the question is twofold. One is, what's the federal government doing to coordinate or support educational programs for cyber professionals in both the civilian and military sectors? And then number two, what's the administration's vision for supporting cyber education certifications for career changes of displaced work workers or shrinking industries? So I guess leveraging uh, industries that may be declining to kind of retrain them uh, to be more productive for the national security. Yeah, boy, I'm wide open to ideas on that that are, uh, that are uh, successful. Uh, we've had a lot of opportunities to try. Maybe the best way to frame it is to explain to the audience that there are, uh, uh, I think, uh, believable estimates that there's upwards of 700,000 cybersecurity jobs unfilled. In other words, there's an employer right now sitting there thinking, boy, I really wish I had X, uh, a network engineer, or, or just somebody that's certified enough to manage my IT system and manage it for the purpose of securing my data, and I can't find that person. In a world in which the unemployment rate is still a problem, that is troubling and it is obvious evidence that people don't have the background training and experience to qualify for that job, otherwise they'd move and take that job. I don't think it's an indictment of capitalism. In fact, uh, the job uh, rate now that's not filled is also accompanied by some of the highest uh, salaries. And so these are unfilled, high paying jobs. And so all the conditions are there to achieve the right outcome, except it takes a little bit of time to cultivate and train people. So I'm wide open to ideas. We've got four or five different initiatives that are being discussed right now, um, uh, programs that would 
uh, help train people, programs that would help uh, give them internships and opportunities to learn on the job. All these things are wide open to us right now and we're willing to try them and I think the government's willing to invest a little bit in them as well. So uh, I wish I had a better answer but we have to find a way to do it and I think part of what I can do is educating the public uh, and you can go out and do is educating the public into knowing that this is a viable job opportunity. Uh, encourage your uh, uh, schools to not think of vocational training as a negative thing. Uh, I can't believe that Votech has become uh, a bad word. Uh, the idea now is you don't have to go and just learn how to uh, you know, rebuild an engine, which is also valuable. You can go and learn how to secure a network. Uh, it's, a, it's a skill, it's a trade, and it's a high paying trade when you get out of that educational system. So uh, please take it seriously. Please help me with that. And that's the answer. Okay. Great. Uh, Tom, you've been very generous with your time. Um, Thank you. we're, I think we're right on time now to get you to your next, uh, next appointment for, for your day. Thank you very much. I know I speak on behalf of FCA and INSA and the audience. Incredibly thoughtful remarks, comprehensive, insightful, and we've all learned something today, and we're glad that you're in the job. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was terrific. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Tish Long, Chairman of the Board for the Na Intelligence and National Security Alliance. So I will tell you, I think we're off to a great start. And as a citizen, um, it's very reassuring to me to have someone like Tom Bossert sitting in the chair that he's in. It's a, a really, really important position. So again, my thanks to Tom and to his staff for getting him here. So now, the real welcome on behalf of the Intelligence and National Security Alliance and Lieutenant General Bob Shea, U.S. Marine Corps retired, who is the president and CEO of AFSIA International, we would both like to welcome you to this fourth annual Intelligence and National Summit. This summit is a unique event. Two organizations founded on the principle of public-private partnership in pursuit of national security have now partnered for four consecutive years to create and sustain a forum for an unclassified discussion about the state of U.S. intelligence. INSA and AFSIA are united in their commitment to bring the entities that must work together to ensure the U.S. intelligence community's health and strength. And that's government, industry, academia, the media, and the American public. The summits are designed to provide a platform for public discussion of intelligence challenges and opportunities, and there are certainly no shortage of that. These challenges and opportunities are magnified in this year of transition and with the myriad issues we face. In addition, the summit highlights innovation and the role it plays in dealing with today's issues and in positioning intelligence capabilities for the future. A critical component of the summit's six plenary and nine breakout sessions is your participation. The summit is strengthened through your questions, your engagement during the breaks, your interaction with the exhibitors, and discussions with participants. With your active engagement, the content of the summit is better tailored to meet your expectations and address your concerns. So, a not so subtle hint, please be active in your participation these two days. Now, an event of this type and size is not possible without sponsorship. And Bob and I would like to recognize and thank our premier sponsors, Accenture, AT&T, Microsoft, and Noblis as well as all of the other sponsors who are shown on the screen and in your programs. Their support and their company's belief in the value of this summit are both gratifying and critical to its success. Now I'd like to turn the podiums over to the two people who are going to make the trains run on time and orchestrate the next two days activities. 
And I might also note that they have played pivotal roles in planning the event, and they are the key leaders in every aspect of the summit execution. So please join me in welcoming Vice Admiral Jake Jacoby, U.S. Navy retired, former director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, and chairman of the FCA Intelligence Committee, also a very good friend, as well as Mr. Chuck Elsup, president of INSA. So I start off by having lost my place. So thank you, Tish, and uh, and I'll speak for for Bob and, and myself. It's great to work with Ensa and uh, you and Chuck and the entire organization uh, on these events and to collaborate on so many things uh, with respect to intelligence and, and our work in the intelligence community. Okay, and it's always great to get together again. This is a great partnership between NSA and FCA. Uh, we're pleased to partner for this fourth time on a summit. And uh, what we think is a really important thing to do, and that is to have an unclassified discussion once in a while, public forum, to talk not just to you, but talk to the American people about what it is that our intelligence community does. And we also welcome the many members of the press that are with us here uh, for the next two days. Uh, we've also broadened the format to include a plenary session tomorrow on combating terrorism. You just heard uh, uh, Tom Bosser talk about uh, Patty McGinnis uh, from, from uh, the UK, who will be on that panel tomorrow. But we're really looking forward to that discussion and for making this a more global discussion about our business. We're also expanding our social media presence and engagement, so we encourage all of you to post your summit experiences uh, on social media using the hashtag intelligence 2017. Uh, we hope that your social media followers uh, know about the great discussions we're holding over the next two days. Again, hashtag intelligence 2017. And then to reiterate Chuck's earlier announcement, uh, we're taking questions through email address to questions at intelsummit.org. And uh, you saw that uh, uh, we actually have the iPad working, and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll try to we'll endeavor to keep the social media <laughs> connection work, going right? all day. I, I have to admit, I'm the one who says I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to juggle an iPad, my questions, listen to the answers uh, to previous questions, and so forth. So you get a chance to watch me uh, try to do that this afternoon with the defense panel. Yeah. So help Jake out in his panel this afternoon. So you know, short questions. Okay. Short. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, Tish also uh, talked about engagement and, and how critical it is to the success of the, uh, of the next two days. Uh, so when you're doing the questions, uh, send them in as early as you can, and that allows us to, uh, uh, to get them to the, uh, to the moderator. And like I say, for you all to grade me this afternoon on my ability to multitask uh, with, the, uh, with the iPad in my hand. Okay, in addition to our premier sponsors, Accenture, AT&T, Microsoft, and Noblis, I'd like to thank our networking reception sponsors, General Dynamics, and Northrop. Also, Tish, Bob, Jake, and I would like to thank the many planners and staff from both AFSIA and ENSA, too numerous to mention here, but the, uh, uh, you'll see the planners in each one of the breakout sessions. Uh, Special recognition goes to the many uh, FCA Intelligence Committee and ENSA Council volunteers who have planned and are leading the breakout sessions. You'll see them there, uh, but uh, there's a lot of folks that have devoted a lot of time uh, to making sure these breakout sessions come together uh, and that they meet, uh, meet your expe expectations. There's a tendency to thank this group at the end of an event when people are packing up to leave. We don't want to wait till then. Uh, these folks put in a lot of time. Uh, and uh, I think you'll see the fruits of their labor in these breakout sessions as they unfold over the next two days. Yeah, and I'd like to add my, my thanks in advance also. Okay. So, after this session, uh, again, we started a little bit early. We're finishing a little bit early. We need to get uh, Tom on his way. Uh, uh, we'll be followed here by a 60-minute networking break, or maybe a little bit shorter than that. Uh, you'll see in your schedule what time the breakout session starts. Uh, this initial break is a little bit longer, 
uh, to accommodate uh, some scheduling uh, changes. The break tomorrow will be a little bit shorter, uh, we think, uh, to accommodate uh, what uh, continues to be a shifting schedule for Congressman Schiff and uh, Senator Warner, uh, who both uh, are kind of working through uh, scheduling things that are happening in real time on the Hill this week. Uh, the intent of the summit is for the plenary sessions to provide overviews of the current and future challenges and opportunities facing the intelligence community and for the breakout sessions to examine specific threat policy and technology issues that will affect U.S. intelligence and its partners for the foreseeable future. You'll be able to choose from one of three sessions beginning at 10.15 a.m. And all those are in your book and on the app and all that good stuff. Uh, please note the location of these sessions. Uh, and that the bridging the innovation intelligence gap session will be held in the exhibit halls. You know, the exhibit hall uh, breakout session is right next door. The two other breakout sessions are one level down on the second floor. The uh, uh, discussion of the exhibit hall uh, brings up the fact that uh, exhibitors are another key component uh, in our summit planning, and uh, they pr come primarily from companies that are bringing innovative capabilities to our intelligence efforts uh, that are fundamental to today's successes, but certainly future successes. And many of them are small companies, and some of you know that that's where much of the innovation actually occurs, and, and we're happy to, uh, to have them here participating. So I'd like to invite our government attendees to engage with our exhibitors and, and use this opportunity to find out what's happening in industry and for our industry attendees to learn what exhibitor companies may be able to contribute to their efforts and to help you fill the uh, small business quotas, and for all to learn about the dedicated efforts that American industry is making in solving some of our most vexing problems. It's, it's our hope that uh, every attendee will visit the exhibit hall to explore the creative technology solutions on display and to meet the dedicated professionals who are behind those technologies. We also have a networking reception this afternoon in the exhibit hall uh, immediately following the defense intelligence panel, and so we hope to see you all there and, again, to, uh, uh, to have the, uh, the opportunity to interact with those exhibitors. Okay, thanks, Jake. And uh, we'll now go uh, into our networking break, uh, and we'll reconvene for our breakout track one, breakout session one at 10.15 followed by lunch at 11.30. The afternoon begins with the breakout session two at 12.45, and we'll reconvene here for the defense plenary session at 2.30 with leaders of defense intelligence, uh, the defense intel service chiefs uh, and the joint staff, uh, moderated by none other than Jake Jacoby. And you'll, you'll have a chance to grade my uh, work uh, with the <laughs> iPad and the, and the juggling act that's gonna go on as part of that. Okay, enjoy the break. Thank you.